So my name is Thomas Arnold, and I'm advisor for uh, sustainable uh, for sustainable development goals in DG research and innovation. Welcome to our first online RNI sustainability talk. Thanks for participating. RNI sustainability talks they offer colleagues an opportunity to exchange ideas with leading personalities and experts on sustainability, sustainable development, and the SDGs. Normally, they take place in our cozy DG R and I uh, library. Today's subject is sustainability science. What is it? Why is it important? What can you do? Today, more than ever, it has become apparent that we need systemic shifts to transform our world, as the title of the UN 2030 agenda is calling for. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has reinforced our other ongoing emergencies, such as climate breakdown, biodiversity destruction, growing in inequalities, all of which are interconnected. The recovery from COVID-19 is Europe's at the world's moment to bounce forward to a more sustainable future, rather than to go back to business as usual of the old fossil world, which has led us into the mess in which we were already before the pandemic. You may have forgotten already Greta Thunberg and all the kids in the streets. While r and is at the core of the response to the pandemic itself, in the areas of virology, vaccine development, uh, treatments, uh, diagnostics. It is also crucial to accelerate the transitions that our planet and society need. So sustainability science may have never been as important as today. Future Earth is one of the key players in the global space of sustainability science. Future Earth is working towards a sustainable global future by developing a deeper understanding of complex earth systems and human dynamics across disciplines. In your daily work, you may already have come across some of the organizations in its governing boards, uh, the Belmont Forum, UNESCO, UNEP, or the International Science Council. I'm welcoming our two speakers from Future Earth. Dr. Josh Tefsbury is the Future Earth USA Global Hub Director. Josh was trained as an ecologist, evolutionary biologist, and conservation biologist. He has more than 20 years of active research focused on climate impacts on plants and animals. Dr. Vera Mitzner is the Future Earth Network Lead, based in the Future Earth USA Global Hub. Vera holds a PhD in history and civilization from the European University Institute. And she has considerable academic experience in science policy and diplomacy, European affairs, international relations. I'm also welcoming our moderators who will guide us through the group discussions. Apurva, Juan, Sharon, Kathy, Andrea, John, and Laurel from the Future Earth hosting team. I want to thank my European Commission colleagues who are providing support to this event and get it up and running. Vula Mega from the International Cooperation Director, Jerome Spans from the DG R&I Library Team, Mariana Bourgiou Zuber and her team from DG Human Resources, and many others, including Marcos and Yvette from the hosting team. With this, I pass the floor to Mariana. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Mariana. Perfect, because uh, for me, the screen is frozen. I cannot see anybody. <laughs> okay, so welcome everybody and thank you. Um, just a little bit of householding. Please note that uh, in order to have a good um, uh, recording, as I mentioned, this session is being recorded, you should mute yourself if you do not speak and uh, turn off the video in case you have these connectivity issues that can arrive anytime. Uh, it's nice to see you on the screen, but if you know that you have a, a slow connection, then you can turn the video off. But during the breakout rooms, it will be really nice that you completely participate and you have your video on if possible. Then um, um, you will see 
that Josh has already taken off the presentation of the breakout rooms. At the moment when they will be presented, you will be asked to put the, uh, your choice in front of your name uh, from one to seven. And then what else? Um, ta -ta 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 -ta. Yes, we will use uh, Zoom, only Zoom for this session and the whiteboard uh, tool uh, that is integrated with Zoom. You will see that our great moderators from Future Earth will lead you through the process in the breakout rooms. And about the uh, netiquette, please speak with intention, listen with attention, and take care that everybody is on board for the discussions in the breakout room. And then afterwards, each uh, subgroup will report back to the plenary. Um, yeah, I think I haven't forgotten anything. Um, I give to Josh for the presentation. Great. Thank you, everyone, for being a part of this and uh, to the great team at, uh, at the European Commission and also in Future Earth for supporting this, this, this connection. Um, we're really excited to talk um, about the future of sustainability science with, uh, with the European Commission and with the VG for Research and Innovation in particular. So I, I will just dive right in and then um, and we'll go um, through maybe 15 or 20 minutes of initial discussions of some of the, the, the major topics of sustainability and the way we see them at Future Earth. And then we'll, we'll uh, focus on some breakout groups where some of the experts in these topics can go, mo go more deeply into the work we're doing and explore some of the work that I'm sure you're doing in these same areas. So let me see if I can get started here. So whether we are talking about the future, of the future of cities or how we do more with more when it comes to energy or food or the, the length and complexity of our global supply chains or the changes we have created in our own climate, um, it's, it's clear now that our impact on planetary systems and the biodiversity in those systems is unmistakable and the impact of changes in these systems on our own lives is growing at an exponential rate. We're living in a human dominated world and sustainability science is the response of the research community to the pressures this world has created for all of us. And so if we, let me get my, if we, if we look at sort of a timeline of the, the growth and, mature, and maturation of sustainability science over the last 50 years, starting with the Stockholm Environmental Conference or the Limits to Growth Report, um, and moving through through the creation of the first global change research programs, the World Climate Research Program, the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, um, and, and the, the, the Brundtland Report, the Our, Our Common Future, um, what we see at the beginning of this progression is a focus on the planet as a system and a focus primarily on natural and physical sciences and our understanding of the system, this globe we live on. And that then led to a recognition that the living parts of that world need global attention as well. So Diversitas and Biodiversity was established as a global program to support our understanding of biodiversity on the planet. And then as we move further, we see the inter integration of human systems with the International Human Dimensions Program, as we recognize that if we're going to create change with science around sustainability, humans have to be deeply engaged and we have to understand human systems and how they relate to natural systems. As we move forward from that point through to the creation of future Earth and, and then um, up until to the present day, where we're also speaking about bringing this community together through the Sustainability Research and Innovation Congress series, that, that trajectory has moved more towards a recognition that we must be focused on solutions, that we must be working across disciplines and not only across disciplines, but also across sectors of society to come up with solutions that, that are science-based, evidence-driven, but connect well with the rest of society with, uh, to create change at the pace we need. And I think <clears throat> this, this um, evolution, you know, begs, begs some, I think some fundamental challenge, it begs us to look carefully at the fundamental challenges we face as a community of researchers focusing on sustainability. Um, you know, the first, and I'm just gonna go through five of these that, w that we focus on in Future Earth is sort of these, the challenges we're facing as we, as we think about the evolution of sustainability science. And the first of this is what I would call, you know, the Great Acceleration or what actually a report out of the International Geosphere Biosphere Program called the Great Acceleration. Um, and this is, you know, starting in about the 1980s, we have seen an exponential acceleration in the pace of change. And that pace of change not only affects human systems, like the, the advent of cell phone, the uptake of cell phone technology or the changes in the size of computer chips. But it also importantly is around our impacts on natural systems. And over that same 30 year period, we have seen the feedback 
from our natural systems also rise exponentially. So it's not unfair to say that in the last three decades, we have gone from a small world on a large planet to a large world on a small planet. And in order to keep pace with that, the, the solutions that, that come from science and must come from the science community have to kind of do two things at once. They have to both be fundamentally rooted in context for them to have impact on the world. And at the same time, to, to work, they also need to be able to, um, to scale and replicate from one place to another because the urgency that we're facing is large. And so this, this uh, push and pull between deep local context to solutions and the need for scalable, replicable solutions is one of the fundamental challenges we face. Um, and, and it's also the, the fact that like, this is, you know, this, this is a tall order because of the inequalities and inequities we face around the world. So both in the distribution of resources and power, but also in the distribution of science capacity itself. In countries such as Finland, Norway, Sweden, the US, we have between four and 7,000 researchers for every million people. In at least 25 countries of the world, we have less than 1% of that capacity, fewer than 75 researchers per, per million people in many countries of the world. This disparity can't be ignored because the future of Europe and the US and other developed nations depends fundamentally on the future of the Amazon, the future of Indonesia and the future of Africa. And so raising that capacity is a serious challenge for the sustainability science community. And then when we think of capacity, I think it's important to recognize that we're not just speaking of technical capacity of, of the research community around the world, but we're also thinking of the capacity of, of, of researchers in one discipline to work rap rapidly and constructively with researchers in other disciplines, and the capacity of multidisciplinary research teams to work with the rest of society. And, and here's where many developing nations actually have a bit of a head start. Um, you know, if we just take a quick thought experiment, and if we took a person from Europe in, in, from Europe in say the 1850s or the 1860s, the height of the Industrial Revolution, we put that person in a time machine and she popped out today, the first thing she'd probably recognize would be the, the local university. Because over the last 150 years, edu our educational system and our higher education system has changed much less than the rest of the world around it. Much of the less rest of the world looks radically different than it did 150 years ago. But our fundamental disciplinary structures within universities have remained fairly unchanged in much of Europe and much of North America. And that poses exceptionally large challenges because the pressures these institutions are facing are vastly different than they were at the height of the Industrial Revolution. So, you know, finally, um, there's the, there's a challenge of uptake and the gap between evidence and uptake. Um, there, you know, in, in a world that is increasingly polarized and politicized, the role of science has become um, has become a political tool in some contexts, and it's critically important that the work that we do and that the work that we support our scientists to do around the world has traction within policy processes and actually leads to change in the world. And there's a tightrope walk to be walked there because the science community must be just that, our science community. And yet to have the impact we need to create the change to sustainability we're looking for, we must create avenues so that we can build traction within other sectors of society so that the pace of change increases from what it is today. This is a challenge that sustainability science really can't ignore as we move forward because we are focused on a fairly on, on time bound problems that have consequence for the world. So, so over the next 10 minutes, I'm going to sort of break out um, our response to those challenges in future Earth into some into some basic areas of work. And, and I think you'll find that within the work that you're all doing within your, your, your contexts, that you'll see parts of this in your own work. And the, the objective here is just to give a, a little bit of a flavor of some of the ways we think of how to approach these challenges and then to have a, con a deeper conversation with people in different breakout rooms um, to, to, to exchange how, we're, how each of us are doing this work and how we might be able to support each other in this work. And the seven areas we're thinking of that we work on a lot are, of course, how to create science products that have impact in the world um, and beyond the science community, how to support scientists in doing that work, how to link science strategically to knowledge communities that need, uh, to, to action communities that need that science 
because they want to create change, but they don't have the evidence they need to do that. Um, the critical role of collective leadership on what kind of elite science leader we need today to tackle the problems of today and tomorrow. Um, how to create really strong narratives for change that are evidence-based and solution-focused. Fundamentally, Future Earth thinks of all of these things in a systems context, and we believe strongly that systems thinking is going to be a big part of what is going to be required to tackle, for example, the, the integrated uh, platform of the Sustainable Development Goals. And then finally, being nimble and responding to the moment. Um, we are at a particular at a moment in time now that is defined by a crisis that is fundamentally a science challenge. And um, our community, like other science communities, must be at that table to help shape a course forward. And you know, in the, in the near and longer term, uh, Future Earth feels very strongly that it is time to build a more robust, um, more inclusive sustainability science community that can come together and support the changes that are needed in local contexts, in regional contexts, and around the world. So these are the areas that we, we focus on. I'm, I'm, I'm putting these little numbers next to these areas. So now, if you're interested in joining, um, as we go through this talk, I'll say a little bit about each one. And then at the end of this, we will sort people into breakout rooms, depending on where the interest is of the participants. And we can do a deeper dive in all of these, in four of these, wherever people want to spend their time talking. And we have experts on each of these on the call today who are leading programs in these areas to talk more deeply about how Future Earth has been attacking, uh, um, working on these challenges and, and what we might learn from each other as we move forward. So before I go into these in, in, some, in a little detail, I wanna just say a little bit about Future Earth as an organization so you get a sense of who we are around the world. And as Tomas suggested, our governing council is a group of organizations familiar to people in this room. And we work a lot with the European, with, with, with European members of these organizations. We even have collaborations with the European Commission on Health and Environment, for example, through the Belmont Forum and some other areas. And so um, institutionally, this body of um, representatives from these organizations, as well as representatives from the core funders of Future Earth Secretariat, um, are the, the, the leading decision body for the organization. Um, we're also highly distributed across the world. And so this map shows in blue the five global hubs that are a part of the Secretariat, one in the US, one in Canada, one in France, one in Sweden, one in Japan, as well as the, in addition to the global hubs, we have six different regional centers and partners, and we have almost 20 national programs. And, and, and the national programs are growing. And so we see these programs emerging with with sustainability science coming up out of Ireland and what it's focused on and comparing that with what's happening in Germany and a, a large European contingent talking with programs, <clears throat> excuse me, in East Asia to really understand what are different, what, where the commonalities and, commonalities and differences are in what is needed to mobilize sustainability science in those contexts, for example. The, the engine of Future Earth is, is our people, our researchers around the world. And, the national programs work with, um, with, glo with, the, with to what I would call topical programs. We call them global research programs. And if you look at this map, the first thing you see is that any way you want to break up the field of sustainability science, we have global communities that are addressing the science relevant to that issue. Whether it's governance, whether it's the coasts, the oceans, the land, the rivers, whether it's focusing on natural assets, food, energy, water, consumption and production and supply chains. We're organizing research communities at a global scale to support integrated research on these topics. The other thing you'll notice from this map is that the center of gravity for the international program offices, the, the engine of this work is Europe. Many of our global research programs are, fo are based in Europe and that's not an accident because of the leadership that the European Commission and the European Union has shown and many European nations have shown in sustainability and in sustainability science. Um, <clears throat> so I'm now going to spend just one slide on each of those seven topic areas and then we'll pass, we'll have deeper discussions in each one. So um, I want to talk a little bit about science for impact and what, what we what we try and do here in many fields is to figure out where the policy community is headed and build science inputs into those policy processes that will allow the transfer of knowledge from an academic community to a policy community. So the global carbon, bu global carbon budget, which comes out each year right at the UNFCCC Conference of Parties, helps 
policymakers understand globally where our emissions are. And in addition, the science that's coming out continuously um, is, is, is coalesced and brought together each year in a new insights on climate science that we put out for policymakers that is science driven, written by scientists, edited by writers, and submitted to the highest level policymakers within the UN, for example. We also try to do a lot of work to be timely. So a paper that just came out this week, for example, in Nature Climate Change was the first paper to focus on how has this, this pandemic changed global, uh, global emissions, the fossil fuel emissions around the world. Um, so CO2 emissions have changed differently in different countries because of different policy responses to the pandemic. This tracks that work. And so this is the kind of thing we're trying to help support. Um, a lot of it comes out of our research communities. The Secretariat is there to amplify that work and to initiate it where needed. But it's also true that the engine of change in society is often not UN agencies, but it happens at a national level. And it's also not entirely, it's not just public sector policy, but it's driven by private sector and industry behavior. And it's also driven increasingly by cities, for example, and their response to the, 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 the challenges we face. Um, a lot of what we try and do is link the science to the stakeholders, to listen to those stakeholders about the science they need, and then develop processes that respond to those needs. And we do that at, at, at mostly at large scales, but also down at, at national scales and subnational. The most sort of high profile example of this work is work of it is, is the Earth Commission, which is a group of global, a global group of uh, scientists focused on Earth systems and human systems coming together to understand what a safe operating space for the planet would look like, but we're not doing that in isolation. We're a part of the Global Commons Alliance, which is a huge, a large group of organizations representing private sector interests, representing cities around the world, representing civil society, coming together to create tools. And the tools have a very specific fo focus. All of us in this room know what a two degree target for climate change means, or a 1.5 degree target. But I would challenge any of us to come up with similar targets for water, biodiversity, land, or oceans. We simply have not developed that clarity of understanding of what those targets should look like at different scales. And until we have that, it's much more difficult for cities and for nations and for private sector major businesses to engage in the process. We are helping to develop the science and then we're working with collaborators to develop the tools to allow businesses and cities to engage in supporting sustainable oceans, sustainable water systems, and, and, a and, and the maintenance of biodiversity. All of this, of course, takes you know, significant amount of, it takes a particular type of scientist to do this work. And all of our programs engage in one way or another around, uh, around supporting leaders. So whether you're Future Earth Australia or Future Earth Ireland, or you're the Global Land Program working on land systems or the Global Carbon Project, their work absolutely supports the career track of key researchers to become international citizens to work across disciplines. But there's a particular space where we need to focus on not just the technical qualities, but the collective leadership qualities that'll allow a scientist to work across disciplines effectively and also to work with, to work with other sectors effectively, to speed the pace at which evidence gets from the academic communities around the world to the communities, uh, to the communities that are creating change and fundamentally to help change the academic system to be a better partner in the changes we need. And our Earth Leadership Program, which was just launched this year, is all about that. It builds on 20 years of success in North America, but it's already working to try and build cohorts around the world. And, at a, at a, and, and a similar program with the Global Sustainability Scholars works on early, early career individuals as well. Have, um, and Sharon will talk more about that in room three. Um, <clears throat> and then, as we spoke at the top, all of the work we do matters um, only if people listen, listen to the science. And you know, fundamentally, that's about telling really compelling stories because storytelling is like the first form of communication for humans and it engages not just the mind, but the heart. And a lot of what we need to do is convince people that this, the work that we do around the world is important for their own daily lives. And, what, and we do this in a number of ways at Future Earth. One of the ones that I really wanted to focus on for this community was you know, the, the role that independent journalism plays our flagship publication, Anthropocene Magazine, is, you know, focuses explicitly on the evidence for solutions to sustainability. It's about innovation, it's about science, it tracks the very best sustainability science and turns that into narratives 
that are accessible to non-science to non-science leaders around the world who have the potential to create change with that knowledge. This comes out online. It comes out in print. We are super excited to explore how it can be how it can expand more effectively around the world. It already has a global audience, but there's lots of potential to to really expand expand this in Europe. And similarly, we have a very robust communications uh, communications department within Future Earth that focuses on create crafting narratives around the sustainable development goals, around sustainability. So our, ten, our, 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 our Future on Earth report that came out just a few months from, from now, a couple of months from now, our pre, excuse me, it came out two months ago, you know, create science insights into our planet and, and, and society. And so these are different ways we approach this, the process of creating narratives that create traction. And, and Sharon, will, and so Kathy will talk more about that. There's also a need for integration. And one of the things that, and one of the things that I really appreciate about the way the European Commission is organized is that you do have a leader for the Sustainable Development Goals who is focused on bringing that whole, the whole community together around the largest platform for sustainability, um, the 2030 agenda that, um, that was, you know, that had such you know, large scale agreement from countries around the world. So this platform has tremendous potential, but it only works if nations engage in the platform and understand how to move forward, how it is that, uh, that, are, that, that investing in one sustainable development goal will affect their ability to invest in others. And what kind of pathways should a country in, in East Africa take and how would that vary from a country that's, that's a developed nation in Northern, in Northern Europe, for example. And understanding that is a science process in engaging with society. It's creating pathways to sustainability and recognizing that these will be context dependent on the country you're in. So we're, we have started a global program going country by country, region by region, asking that question, engaging scientists in a, in a collaborative process with their own policymakers and decision makers to understand how they, that country and can approach the sustainable development goals most appropriately and most effectively. Because we focus on environment, we use a lens of the major four sustainable development goals that have environmental context, clean water and san sanitation, climate action, life below water and life on land and how it connects to all the other goals. And I'll talk more about that in one of the breakout rooms. And then finally, um, being present in this present moment is you know, absolutely critical. Um, so uh, all of us probably, and all of our research programs have taken a major shift over the last two to three months, even the last six weeks, and are trying to catch up. We're trying to do library talks on Zoom for as a, as a very small example. But we're also shifting whole research programs to be relevant to the crisis we're facing today. And of course, the pandemic we're facing today is, um, is a symptom of a larger crisis. And it's also fundamentally a, ch a challenge that is a science challenge. And so our community has to be at the table. Um, our human activities are destabilizing natural systems. We know that, we know the link, and science has told us the link, shown the, shown the link between sustainability and public health. Um, and the future we bring to the world, the future that comes out of the, this pandemic will be different than the past. And that creates sort of an obligation for the science community to support um, a positive vision of that future so that we are sustainability positive, moving in a direction that supports our sustainable goals as we transition out of this crisis. So um, we'll, I would like to talk about some of the work we're doing in there and see how we can work with each other to support the work that I'm sure you're doing in the same area. I guess, um, finally, um, when, we, when we first came to Thomas and started speaking about the, this possibility of giving this talk, we came in with a particular lens. And it's a lens we're really proud of and really want to work with you on. And it's the idea that it is time for the sustainable, sustainability science community to come together around the world. And I want to pass, um, pass these last final slides to Vera so that she can speak um, about Sustainability Research and Innovation Congress that, she, uh, that we, have been, we have been building with the Belmont Forum. And I, I will control the slides for you, Vera, because it's just easier. But if you want to take, take, uh, take the baton here and talk a bit about what, we're, what the plan is here and why we're doing it, I think that would give people some context for this part of our work. Great, thank you, Josh. Yes, so the Sustainability Research and Innovation Congress is, is a joint initiative. Just, just, just mentioned a future Earth at the Belmont Forum. Um, it's a conference series. Uh, we are planning to organize a big gathering every year for the global sustainability community. 
And it was born out of the realization that there isn't a platform that would enable the users and the producers of sustainable designs and knowledge to come together worldwide to tackle some of the issues that Josh was speaking about earlier in this presentation. So we wanted to create this home, this platform, that would be something stable, something where uh, people feel people feel connected uh, with their peers. Uh, so next slide, please. Can you go one more, Josh? Then we can come back to this one. Yes, perfect. So when we created SRI, um, we really wanted to do something that's truly dynamic, that's inclusive, um, that's inspiring, and that is very much action oriented. We didn't want to have another big international meeting where people just come to talk. So we really wanted to offer the oppor real opportunities for knowledge exchange between different stakeholders, between different disciplines. Uh, we wanted to really generate actions and uh, develop collaborations. So we created these goals for the series. This is now says SRI 2021, but it's really, so really the goals um, for the entire Congress series. And you can go back to this previous slide, Josh. Sorry, I moved. Um, thank, you. thank you so much. Oh, sorry, there we are. Um, no, no, go one more. <laughs> one more back? This way? Yeah, to the teams, the teams. Sorry, the teams. teams. I think, sorry, this should be yeah. the themes. There's a delay, so sorry about that. It that's will show up on your side eventually in the right slide. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we were we were hoping and, and planning to have our first conference this June in 2020. Um, but because of the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, we were forced to reschedule. Um, and now, now SRI 2021 will take place in Brisbane, Australia in June 2021. But that puts us in a great place. Um, we already have a strong and rich program developed for SRI 2020. And indeed, we were overwhelmed by the high number of high quality, innovative session proposals coming from all over the world, many of them from Europe, but really um, the sessions represent pretty much the global sustainability community. And um, we are now rolling the accepted proposals to 2021. So the program is pretty much designed. We also have a committee um, host. We have a, a global well-functioning team. And we do have uh, great sponsors who are committed to working with us next year as well. Um, and also before the COVID-19 outbreak, we did have this ambition of creating a hybrid meeting. Um, this is largely because we believe that the global sustainability science community needs to be a leader when it comes to uh, low carbon and inclusive conferencing. So SRI 2021 will certainly be, um, will certainly have a strong virtual element to it. Uh, we're hoping to have some in-person activities it remains to be seen, as we all know, it's, a, it's an uncertain world where we live right now. Um, and as, as I mentioned at the beginning, so SRI will be happening every year. Uh, we will be launching um, Global for SRI 2022 host um, or hosts uh, very soon. We, are, we will be exploring ways of having multiple hubs and locations to even further um, de reduce our e ecological footprint from travel. And those teams might probably um, might be connected to the UN um, Stockholm Plus 50 conference. But this year we have four teams, uh, sustainable sol solutions from the global south, knowledge to action, sustainability for who, and integrated action for SDGs. Um, with this work, we're really hoping to build a community. And even though we won't have a Congress until June 2021, we are doing a lot through our website, uh, sri2021.org. 
Um, and also we have social media, media channels for SRI. We will be featuring interviews, um, blogs, talks. We'll do smaller scale virtual events, really trying to build the momentum towards June 2021. Um, next slide and the slide after the next slides, please. The one with the spawn little bloggers. Yeah, so this shows um, our partners, hosts and sponsors. And I wanted to show this as the sla last slide because um, we're really hoping to explore with you in the breakout rooms how this platform could support the European Commission um, in achieving its goals and, and how it could give visibility for the work that you're already doing um, in the sustainability space.